chapter 15. Sunday school is in commenced again, so um, thank you for those who are responsible for that. And crash, yeah, crash as well. So just follow the ladies out the back if you um, wish to go to crash. <laughs> the children, I mean. Yeah. Okay, actually we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 14. It's quite a large chunk of scripture that we're going to be looking at today and, um, and mainly because it's a narrative that should be read through all in one sitting. And um, anyway, and um, so I don't want to um, detract in any way from that or as least as possible. So we're going to pick up from Mark 14 verse 43 and we're going to read right through to verse 15 of chapter 15. So if you follow with me, I'm reading from the NASB, so um, I'm sure you'll be able to track... Verse 43 of chapter 14 of Mark's Gospel. Immediately, while he was still speaking, that is Jesus, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were, the chief, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And after coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill scriptures. And they, that's the disciples, all left him and fled. A young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body and they seized him but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. I often wonder why they put that verse there. I think it was to bring it, give us all a bit of a smile because it has a bit of humour. Jackie Bird just reminded me. She reckons it's her favourite text. I don't know why but there you are. Um, she wanted me to preach on that particular verse one day but I said, no, we'll leave that for someone else. But um, enter into the humour of it all. There is a humorous side to it, okay? And um, that's what happened. Verse 53, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had followed him at, the, at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. Verse 60, The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. And again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. Verse 66, And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the porch And the servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were saying again to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed in a second second time, And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. Early in the morning, the chief priests 
with the scri- elders and the scribes and the whole council immediately held col- a consultation and, and, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, it is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Verse 6, 15. Now at the, at the feast he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had, done, had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. And answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him, wishing to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed them over to be crucified. Sure, God will add a blessing to his word. As I was reading this, I was reminded in New Zealand many years ago, Gwen will remember this, I'm positive. There was a double homicide committed. And after many months, a man was arrested and charged with the crime. And this case actually took the country by storm and the media week after week, month after month, and actually went into the years because there was an appeal to the High Court in England and um, the media just reveled in this frenzy. The main reason this particular case captivated the populace of New Zealand was that the evidence the authorities used to bring this man or charge this man was questionable, to say the least. And as a result, division erupted among the New Zealand populace on this. You either sided with Arthur Allen Thomas was guilty as charged or Arthur Allen Thomas was innocent owing to dodgy evidence. You remember that, Gwen, right? Oh, yes. So what people did is they compiled in their minds all the media information over the years of the trials and inquiries and they came to their own conclusions. And this case was so powerful and in your face that everyone was confronted with the inescapable question, what do you believe about Arthur Allen Thomas? Well, this morning I want to bring to your attention another inescapable question. Pontius Pilate, as in our text here, has coined this question for us and I want you to take particular notice of that. He said in relation to Jesus Christ in verse 12 of chapter 15, What shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? Or in Matthew's account, Matthew coins it like this, What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Matthew 27 verse 22. There's the inescapable question. This is inescapable for us today as it was in history and is far more important than the question New Zealand faced over Arthur Allen Thomas or any other question that you might be faced with in life. Far more important. This all-important question is inescapable because whether you are indifferent about Jesus Christ or not, he makes a claim on your heart and he makes a claim on every human heart that's ever pulsed. And his claim on you is being revisited this morning. May being visited for the first time, to your knowledge. Whatever the case, the inescapable question of what will you do with Jesus Christ will result in you either sitting in one or the other camp. Either you will believe and trust in God and all that he has done through his beloved son, Jesus Christ, to deal with your sin and eternal salvation, you will either sit there and hang on to that and believe in that, or you will reject him and remain indifferent and trust in whatever goes for your eternal destiny. 
One or two camps. The inescapable question, there's no middle ground, there's no grey area, so you're leaving either one or two camps. And so what I want you to do this morning is not so much, well, what I want to do this morning is not so much exegete this passage text by text, otherwise we'd be here for forever, but look at how four different lots of people responded to this claim, this inescapable question on their lives, okay? They gave their answer for us in how they responded to Jesus Christ. And so let's follow briefly their steps and may this help us truthfully for ourselves answer the question. The first person we're going to be looking at is Judas Iscariot. He was a man who followed Jesus but chose to betray him. Okay? The second group are the religious leaders or the religious rulers who hated Jesus and they demanded his death. The third one is Peter, a disciple of Jesus, who denied him and then wept bitterly. And lastly, Pontius Pilate, who was indifferent toward Jesus and so was swayed with the crowd. Okay, let's have a look at our first person, Judas Iscariot. I guess of all the disciples of Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot will be rightfully known as the black sheep of the family, right? The upper room service, as we've been looking at in recent weeks, the upper room service was still in progress when actually Jesus had, when Judas left. He left that wonderful occasion, that blessed occasion when, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as well. He left that room to betray Jesus for the 30 pieces of silver into the hands of the religious leaders, the Judea, Jude, Jude, Jewish leaders, And these guys hated Jesus with an increasing passion. So from Judas' perspective, now was an excellent opportunity to do the deal. It was dark and it was late at night and Judas, knowing Jesus well, rightly surmised that I know where Jesus will be. He will be in the garden. And so the plan was all set in motion. You see, selfish interest consumed Judas so much that nothing was going to stop him now. He had so given himself over to greed and selfishness that actually now Satan had seen this openness and had embedded in him a non-negotiable deal. A non-negotiable deal. A word of warning. Let's not open ourselves up to evil and wickedness and Satan because Satan can still do that. So for Judas, Jesus had only proved to be a a disappointment to him, a bitter disappointment to him. To Judas, Jesus was, was not the Messiah he was expecting. For Judas, following Jesus, there was no power and prestige as a reward of being one of his disciples. Instead of Jesus teaching him and teaching them how to conquer and control, Jesus, their rabbi, their master, their leader, taught only about submission and serving. Why, he was not even richer than he first began. Except, of course, when he stuck his hand into the tool, as we read that he often did, according to John chapter 12, verse 6. Because Judas was a thief, right? You see, there was no turning back in Judas' life now. And this is where we come to it in our text. We see it in verse, chapter 14, verse 45. And here was he is in the garden. And after coming, he immediately, that's Judas, he went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. Imagine that, folks. Imagine that. The disciple, a friend of Jesus, one who had the privilege of seeing Jesus in action, his miracles, his teaching, his love, one whom Jesus unreservedly shared his love with, his companionship with, his truth with, for three years, and now Judas turns his back on all that and he betrays the Lord Jesus with an intimate, yet a totally hypocritical kiss. This must have wounded Jesus far more than any of the rantings and the ravings and the slaps and the spittings that he received a little later on. He was a man who had every opportunity, a man that even the other disciples accepted as being one of the family. 
He had every opportunity. Matthew tells us that, that Jesus turned to Judas at this very time. And you know what Matthew's account says? Jesus said to Judas, friend, imagine that, friend, do what you have come to do. What a farewell statement that was to Judas at that moment. One who had every privilege of every other disciple they had. How tormenting those words would be ringing in Judas's ears for eternity in the judgment of hell. Friend, do what you have come to do. You see, folks, Judas answered the question. He answered the question, what shall I do with him, the king of the Jews? He betrayed him. He sold him out and he sold his own soul to the devil for 30 pieces of silver. Now, as we look at Judas, we know that his betrayal and the direct outcome of his actions was unique to Judas. True. But his basic attitude is characteristic of every false believer. You hear that? His basic attitude is characteristic of every false believer. What Judas was reflects not only the wickedness of sinful people, but the wretchedness of false disciples. You see, folks, like Judas, false believers are motivated by what? They are motivated by self-interest. False believers are those who are motivated and marked by deceit and hypocrisy. They pretend to be loyal and spiritual and devoted to Jesus. They pretend to value his word. They tend to pretend to value his church. All those things. They even say the right words. But when harvest time comes, spiritually speaking, when harvest time comes, you know who they're going to be like? They're going to be like the tares that Jesus speaks about. The tares among the wheat whom God alone only knows. And then he will sort them out for their eternal judgment. My dear people, be warned. Be warned. Like Judas, it is possible to spend heaps of time in Jesus' company. We go to church. We hear convicting sermons. We sit under sound Bible teaching. We may even be baptized. Yet we can spurn the genuine call of the gospel of fully trusting in Jesus Christ. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. Judas is the supreme example of wasted privilege and missed opportunity. You hear that? Judas is the supreme example of a wasted privilege and a missed opportunity. Here's a picture of all those who forsake the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads them to repentance. You get that from Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Here's a picture of today's hypocrite who pretends to love God, but in the final analysis answers that inescapable question. What will you do with Jesus? They reject him. And like Judas, like Judas, they will also see their just reward, eternal damnation. Let us all understand and be warned of the folly of Judas's response. We're going to move on to the next group. The next group that answered our inescapable question is the religionists. Jewry, Judaism. These are the guys who hated Jesus and demanded his death. And we re- picked this up from verses 53 to 65. Uh, one clear difference in this response towards Jesus was unlike Judas' pretense and deceitfulness, you know, he sort of snuck around the, through the back door and pretended lots of things. These people were blatantly in your face and hateful. They made no bones about it. You could read these guys a mile off. You can smell them coming, can I say. The evidence of any crime committed by Jesus, it was non-existent. But that did not stop these guys. No, no. Let's stitch him up with trumped up charges was their ploy. Even though Judaism had, been, had prided itself in its sense of fairness and, and justice and mercy, which is because it was based on God's law that you read of in the Old Testament. It prided itself on that. All this was thrown to the wind when it came to the hearing of Jesus, can we say. And so leading the charge, leading the charge was Caiaphas, the high priest. And if you look at John 18 account, you will see that, uh, that 
Annas was there. That's Caiaphas' father-in-law. He was the first one who saw him. Then, it, then it, Mark records only Caiaphas. But the two of them um, who were head, head honchos of Judaism, they both had a hearing. And um, this was like a Jewish trial, but this Jewish trial did not have the authority to pass sentence and death, you see, because it was restricted by the Roman authority that had the, had the final say. But this was a Jewish hearing. It was like a, a preliminary trial, so to speak before taking it to the higher court of Rome itself. And so their hate of Jesus was evident. You see, to them he was an imposter. To them he was an imposter. And this hate of him, it so overrode any sense of justice that they blatantly violated every principle Jewish law stood on. And no doubt things were still pretty hot in their memory because only a few days before... Remember, Jesus had gone in and with a whip and he had cleansed the temple. And a lot of these guys, no doubt, still probably suffered some of the wounds, I don't know. But uh, certainly wounded pride and and so forth. And and they could remember this clearly. And it was an indictment upon them. And um, and they were seething about all this stuff and uh, they weren't going to stop at anything. They wanted Jesus to receive a death penalty. But as our text state, try as they may, they could not find any legitimate charges against him even though many false witnesses were brought forward. There was nothing consistent in their, their testimony. And then finally the question came from the high priest. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? We see that in verse 61 of Mark chapter 14. In other words, are you the Son of God? Are you God in the flesh? This is what he was asking. Now this was not a genuine question of inquiry, by the way. No. This was a question that was loaded with clever antagonism that longed to hear an affirmative answer, which he got, in order to satisfy their murderous intent. That's what it was all about. So when Jesus breaks his silence, he says this, I am, and you will see the Son of Man, referring to himself, sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Verse 62. So Jesus does answer in the affirmative. And then we see the real heart of these religionists are put on display. They went berserk. Berserk with venomous hatred. Blasphemy was the first word that basically came to their mouths. And they laid that charge upon Jesus because he called himself and referred to himself as the Son of God and being equal with God. Isn't it amazing how many religious people today will go along with most things you say, but when it comes down to acknowledging the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is that Jesus is God. They balk at that and they will not move on it. Nothing changes, folks. Some of our very, very good friends that we have in the religious circles, I'm not talking about the evangelical circles, that's one of our fundamentals of our faith. I'm talking outside, in the cults, and even their religious people. They balk at the deity of Christ. And these guys were balking here. They said, this is blasphemy. How can a man in the flesh call himself God? So in this tirade of hatred, we see the lovely Lord Jesus. The one who does, he withholds his, he doesn't withhold his face from the shame and the spitting. One who, we see him who submits his back to the smiters. His meek endurance and his passive submission They're not simply the action of a martyr for the cause, so to speak. But here he is, the very Son of God, silently and patiently bearing the hatred of men because he knew that this was his pathway to the cross for our redemption. And so while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he made no threats. He kept, you know what he did? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. 1 Peter 2.23. This is what he was doing here. He suffered what they heaped upon him and then he looked to God in all things and put himself in his care and trusted him. My dear people, as we think about the situation going down here, it's rather ironic because it's not Jesus on trial on this occasion. It wasn't Jesus on trial here. Who, the ones who were on trial were these religionists who unbeknown to them at the time, they were standing in the docks of God's courtroom and upon their response 
blasphemy, rejection, they were guilty. They were guilty. These religious people who knew about God but rejected His Son are the ones who had a, they had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. They answered this inescapable question, what shall I do with him who you call the king of Jews? They rejected that Jesus was the son of God and they spat in his face their clear answer, literally. How bad was that, right? How could anyone stoop so low, especially to people who knew so much? Now this, folks, millions of careful, careless people reject with blatant unbelief, the claims of Jesus Christ on their lives today. Millions. Every person who rejects Christ spits in his face, as it were, and is guilty of blasphemy against God, who sent his beloved son to save them. And the ironical thing is that any wrong judgment of Jesus Christ now will one day result in themselves being judged. So you can believe what you like about Jesus Christ, but unless it's the absolute right belief according to the Scriptures, you will be judged for that one day. The tables will be turned. It is possible a person may continue to misjudge Jesus, but God Himself, the Lord of Heaven, Jesus Christ Himself, He will never misjudge you. May it be that none of us here this morning are blatantly ignoring or refusing to accept and believe in God's Son. What a wonderful thing to have a Saviour, right? And to know God's way of salvation and believe in that. The third person that we want to have a look at this morning is Peter. He also answered this inescapable question. And Peter was a disciple of Jesus who denied him and then went out and wept bitterly. Wow, who, who would have ever thought that a follower of Jesus, one who we have already talked about being in the inner circle, you know, Peter, James and John, who would have ever thought that such a person could stoop as low and fall as low as Peter did and still be used of God as he was? I guess it was left for you and me to, to do it. We would say, okay, mate, you've, you've, you've done your deal now. That's, you're out, out now. Praise God that we're not God, right? The Lord picked him up and used him mightily. And I know we looked at Peter's demise somewhat last week and, um, and we traced his collapse. And I call it the collapse because uh, we, we looked at his egotistical, self-inflated opinion of himself. We have that right back in verse 31, the, first, the verse prior to where we started reading, uh, where Peter says, Even if I have to die with you, Lord, I will not deny you. That's what he said. That was a first kind of step to his demise, to his collapse. The next one was his unwillingness to submit to Jesus' warning of this denial. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter threw those with no way, Lord, absolutely no way. His unwillingness to submit to the word of God, that's what was happening here. And then thirdly, this is the next step of it, in the garden, We see prayer was not on Peter's agenda, or for John and James as that matter, but we're looking at Peter on this occasion. The only thing that was on Peter's agenda was, wow, I'm tired and I need my sleep. He even ignored the command of Jesus to watch. And then fourthly, the next step, his self-independent shriek, it came to the fore in impulsively taking matters into his own hands and he drew out a sword and thankfully he was a poor swordsman because he only locked the guy's ear off. He should have stuck to his fishing. And we picked that up, not in Mark, but you go to John chapter 18, you'll read it was Peter that was the guy that drew the sword. He was so out of touch with his master that according to Peter's scheme of things, Jesus was not to be arrested. Even though Jesus, time and time again, as we've looked at through Mark, that Jesus told them that I have come to be crucified and die and be raised again. They rejected that, they ignored that, they buried that, they put it under the carpet, and Peter was certainly doing that here. And then finally, just before his collapse, Peter thought that he would be safe in bad company. He went and warmed himself by the fire, you know. 
I was thinking of that when I was talking, about, talking before. I said, I love riding with pagans. <laughs> I don't think I'm safe with them, not on a bike for a start. Pray, I just pray that when I go there, I'll be given, the, I'll be given the, the ability to speak the gospel into their lives. But Peter went there because he thought he'd be safe. And so you can trace Peter's decline step by step. And in this situation, Peter was not protected by God from being tested above his ability to resist in this situation, folks. That's an amazing thing. And that's a fearful thing. That's an interesting thing. The Lord's promise to his children not to be tempted above what you are able, as we have in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and to rescue the godly from temptation, does not apply when willful disobedience is in action. So if you just throw yourself to the wind there and think that, well, whatever, God will protect me from temptation. No, no, no. It doesn't work. And so that's where Peter was at this time. Step by step, there was a decline until this collapse took place. The final one was where he thought he was safe in bad company. So Peter too also answers the question, what shall I do with him you call king of the Jews? Peter denied the Lord. But only temporarily. Praise the Lord for that, right? Praise the Lord for that. Only temporarily. For we see in verse 72, and immediately the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now here is where we see a vast difference between Judas who betrayed him and went out and hanged himself, Matthew 27, and Peter who denied the Lord and went out and wept bitterly. A vast difference. Judas did not repent. The word metaneo there, the idea of turning from sin and turning to God, he, he, he didn't do that. He felt remorseful. Of course he did. He was gutted, as we say over here. Yes. About this terrible thing that he'd done. There was a self-loathing in, within himself. Why he even went back and he threw the money. Look, I want to turn the clock back more or less. He had all that. But folks, remorse for any terrible deed and even a self-loathing and even confession of sin in and of themselves is not biblical repentance which leads to forgiveness and salvation. It's not. True repentance like Peter entered into and began here is a turning from sin and a turning to God in in Jesus Christ and that's exactly what Peter did. And if you want to see the evidence of that, you just keep on reading the Scriptures and you will look how God mightily used this man and how he gave his life and even became, as history tells us, a martyr for Jesus Christ. Peter was deeply smitten. Judas, first of all, he was so occupied with his own misery that he went out and hanged himself, but Peter was deeply smitten and he remembered the words of Jesus The Word of God, hear this? He heard the Word of God, he remembered it, and then he went out and wept bitterly. This was the beginning of his genuine repentance. This was, this man is not seen in his true light when he fell, folks. No way. And we all fall, right? Us Christians, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We muck up. We mistake. We make mistakes. Why? We even do things like Peter and deny the Lord. We may not do it exactly like Peter did with oaths and cursing, but I'll guarantee there are many times we have shut up when we have spoken and we have not said anything when we should have or went with a crowd when we shouldn't have. Well, Peter repented. His faith had slipped and weakened. But that faith that Peter had, it was genuine. It was genuine faith, folks. And do not forget either, do not forget, there's another side of this, that Jesus had prayed for this man earlier on, remember? We read this in Luke 22 and 32. And Jesus said to him, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, there's repentance, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And the Lord doesn't pray on this, does he? He is absolutely 100% spirit-filled with his prayer. 
It was not until Peter saw the Lord's face and remembered the Lord's words that he came to his senses and acknowledged his sin and repented. It was not a sin that made Peter repent. You know, many, as I said before, many people are conscious of sin and they confess it and they, and they share it with others, etc. And, and it brings a, it may even bring some sense of relief for a, for a measure. But it was only when Peter being convicted upon the word of God, he remembered the words of Christ, the word of God, and he surrendered his sin to Jesus Christ. That's the only way, because he alone is the only one to forgive and remove it. My dear people, restoration and forgiveness only come from turning from sin to God and nothing else. Peter answered the inescapable question by giving the rest of his life to the Lord. And as I said before, history tells us that he died a martyr and the scriptures indicate it, that he died a martyr for our Lord and Saviour. May we be those Christians who are not only just remorseful about our sin, And not only confess our sin, maybe even to ourselves, but come to the Lord about it. Remember John 1, if we confess our sin, he is faithful faithful to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's an ongoing thing, folks. To grow in Christ and to experience and know something of the sanctifying work of Christ in your life, that must be an ongoing thing. Don't think you can do it alone. Otherwise, you'll end up like Peter. You'll end up like Peter. And finally, we see another individual answer this inescapable question. This is Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was indifferent about Jesus and so was swayed with the crowd. I guess if there was a representative of any representative person that would symbolize so many Australians today uh, and possibly right throughout the West in attitude toward Jesus, it would have to be Pontius Pilate. Now, why do I say that? Well, he was a man who tried to sit on the fence, so to speak, in this whole sordid affair, okay? Actually, we see in the narrative here that we have read fairly clearly that Pilate wanted Jesus to be set free. Now, this was not a personal religious conviction on his part, no, but simply because all his Roman law boxes hadn't been ticked that demanded anything else than freedom. You see, Pilate was a man who needed to protect his job. And if you look at the history of Pilate right at this time, it was pretty precarious. There was quite a few other happenings, I won't go into them now, that Pilate was sort of on probation, as it were, from the head honcho in Rome, the emperor. There had been a few things that had been mucked up in his career and he had made some bad mistakes on. And so here he is at this time in a very precarious position and now my job's at stake. My job's at stake. He even tried to encourage Jesus to speak up, to defend himself against these envious, religious, angry constituents that were on his patch. Do you make no answer, he said in verse 4 of chapter 15, do you make no answer? See how many charges they are bringing against you. In other words, what Pilate was saying here, for goodness sake, man, there's charges against here that will send you away for a long time or worse still, do you some serious damage. So speak up for goodness sake and defend yourself. That's what Pilate was saying. And under his breath all the time, of course, Pilate was also saying, because really my job is at stake here and uh, any other incident that might go against me is not going to be good. But we see that Jesus remained silent. This silent action was not Jesus sulking, by the way. Jesus didn't sulk. You see, 700 years before this happening, Isaiah the prophet prophesied of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the coming one, And this is what he said. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers are silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53 verse 7. Pilate even gave them the option, that's the Jews that were screaming for uh, for his crucifixion, he gave them the option of the traditional release of a prisoner of their choosing. And they were expecting this too. It was something they did every Passover meal. And so thinking that Jesus might be their choice because he only offered them bad guys, okay, 
It was only bad guys who were really, uh, yeah, the pets, as it were. And so thinking Jesus might be their choice, he, he, he brought that to their attention. But their choice of a murderer over the innocent Jesus was a final straw in Pilate's dilemma. It was a final straw. He cries out and gives an answer to that inescapable question. What shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? The answer of the people was crucify him. They screamed it out and demanded it. And so what did Pilate do? So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, you hear that? Wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. You see, folks, this is why Pilate symbolizes so many people and perhaps you this morning, I hope not. He went with the crowd. Peer pressure is not something for 2011, 2012. Peer pressure has always been there. It's powerful. It's real. Satan uses it as a tool to suck so many in to his ways. The voice and the pressure of others swayed Pilate's response. So that inescapable question, what will I do with Jesus Christ, who was called the Christ, he chose to reject Christ in favour of the voice of simple people. That's what he did. That's what he did. The voice of culture, the voice of friends, and even maybe the voice of family is a tremendous pressure on your decisions about the Lord Jesus. The fear of man and wanting to be accepted by the crowd, as I said before, is a powerful tool that Satan uses. He uses it to sidetrack people. And the voice of the crowd still cries today, away with Christ, crucify him. That's what the crowd still says today. Crucify him if you want. Forget about eternity and come in with us. Be accepted and enjoy the ride. You see, that's basically what the cry is of our culture. The cry today is all about the immediate, tangible and feeling good kind of things. That's what it is. Forget about eternal matters. Forget about your sin problem and how Jesus Christ has an inescapable claim on your life. Forget about all that. That's the cry today. I wonder what you've listened to. I wonder what you're heeding to. Well, we've looked at how people in the past have answered this inescapable question concerning Christ. What's your answer? This is very much a gospel message today. And if there are any people who don't know Jesus Christ as Saviour, uh, this, is a, this is a time when you cannot escape it. What is your answer to this? You see, if you do not humble yourself and trust Jesus Christ as your Saviour, your personal sin bearer, the one who died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin, you know what you're doing? You're rejecting him. You put yourself in one camp. Even sitting on the fence or being indifferent about him is rejection. And that response, dear friend, it will have eternal consequences where God's wrath will be your lot forever. Serious stuff. Christians, believers, myself, where is Jesus in your life? How are you responding to him? Are you obeying his word? Is he central in all that you say and do? Because if we compartmentalise him and put him over here and I have my life over here and I'll do my... We're, we're basically responding to this person. What will you do with Jesus who is king of the Jews? It's a form of rejection. It could even be one of those steps down to where you deny him. And I don't want to ever get there and I know you don't want to ever get there. I guess the old hymn sums it up well, isn't it? Trust and obey for there's no other way but to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.